Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about U.S. military veterans. Our guest is Michael Messner, who is a professor of sociology and gender studies at the University of Southern California. He received his Ph.D. in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley, he is the author or editor of 19 books and has, in recent years, focused his research on U.S. military veterans who become lifelong advocates for peace and social justice. The first book based on this research, Guys Like Me, Five Wars, Five Veterans for Peace, which I highly recommend, was published by Rutgers in 2019. And the new one, Unconventional Combat, Intersectional Action in the Veterans Peace Movement is hot off the press from Oxford University Press. The website is unconventionalcombat.com. Messner is an associate or non-veteran member of Veterans for Peace, on whose advisory board I serve. And Mike Messner, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I just I just so respect all of the work that you do. So it's really an honor to be on your program. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, same to you. And uh, I, I'm an advisory board member. You're a, an associate member of Veterans for Peace. I didn't uh, I didn't realize till I got most of the way through this book how much criticism there was of Veterans for Peace in there. But I think it's constructive criticism. So we'll we'll get to that, I hope. But um, the, the, the U.S. military increasingly is made up of women, right? A growing fraction is, is women. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, back in the early 70s when the U.S. ended its draft, I think the U.S. military uh, active duty was only 2 or 3%, and now I think it's pushing up closer to, to 20% in, in terms of active, active duty and reservists. Um, and that has an impact on the, you know, the, the sort of constitution of people who are moving into the veterans peace movement. I think that veterans for peace that you know I was studying and focusing on more in that first book you mentioned, guys like me, uh, which is a book that focuses mostly on men. Um, you know, is an organization that's dominated mostly by older men, mostly white heterosexually identified men. Um, many of them nowadays from the Vietnam War era. Um, and it makes sense that now we're seeing an influx of uh, more women into the veterans peace movement, both into Veterans for Peace and, of course, About Face, which is another organization I studied that is uh, made up mostly of post-9-11 veterans. Right, and Veterans for Peace played a role in starting that organization as IVAW, Iraq Veterans Against the War, uh, which, for better or worse, they made as a separate organization, right? That's right, and there's continuing dialogue and, and you know, pretty good overlap in the membership in those two organizations as well, but I think uh, um, Iraq Veterans Against the War was really gestated out of a, uh, um, a Veterans for Peace uh, convention uh, not long after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and, uh, and uh, they've done a lot of really good work, and, and uh, they have, uh, I think, you know, one of the things I look at in the book is that, that About Face has really uh, you know, dealt with the, the, the sort of new influx of a newer, much more diverse generation of veterans. Uh, and I think uh, Veterans for Peace is struggling quite a bit more with that. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, just the growth of the number of women in the military, um, there, there's, you know, since uh, over the last 15 or 20 years, women in the military also have been uh, closer to and, and right in, this, uh, in the middle of combat situations. So a lot of the women veterans that are coming out now and in recent years share a lot of the same experiences that men veterans have with uh, experiences that, that have really led to levels of PTSD that they need to seek help from. And in addition to that, a lot of women veterans, the, a lot of the trauma that they've absorbed during their time in the military uh, is not due to things that were done by enemy combatants, but by their own uh, colleagues in the service. And so you have high levels of sexual harassment, sexual assault, uh, domestic violence. Um, and uh, so, so there's kind of a, a new term added, a recent term added to the PTSD and moral injury issues that a lot of veterans have dealt with and are trying to deal with, which is military sexual trauma, uh, which some men, of course, you know, are sexually assaulted as well. But uh, I think women 
veterans are are really bringing this issue are trying to bring this issue in to the forefront of the of the, these organizations like veterans for peace yeah this this new book unconventional combat uh, you should maybe explain if you want what that title means but uh it, it seems that the u.s military has admitted women into it but it's still the training and the culture in many cases is extremely disparaging of women right that's right. And of anything, you know, considered feminine in men as well. I think there's a very narrow sort of military masculinity that's valorized still. Um, it hurts a lot of men, like, you know, one, one of the men that I, uh, that I focus on, I focus on mostly women in this, in this book, but uh, Stephen Funk, who's a, in the Marine Corps, a gay man of color in the Marine Corps, he talks very, I think, articulately about the ways in which that sort of narrow military masculinity hurts men who don't conform or don't fit into the sort of bodily standards or the behavioral standards of the Marine Corps. Um, but the title you asked about, uh, Unconventional Combat, that came from an interview with the uh, Army veteran Monisha Rios, who, when she entered into uh, working with Veterans for Peace a few years ago, she told me later in an interview that um, she uh, she realized that even she already knew that among veterans there was a kind of hierarchy. You know, if you were in combat, you you uh, were more likely to be respected by other veterans than if you weren't. But she was kind of surprised to find that this was even true in the veterans peace movement. And when she would meet people as she was getting into veterans for peace, and they would ask her, "Were you in combat?" and she wasn't in combat, but she said, "I I quickly realized uh, how I would answer that question. I would tell them." You know, every day when I was in the military, I had to work and strategize to keep myself from getting raped. And so, yes, I was in combat, but it was unconventional combat. Um, and that's where I, I got the title from that uh, quote, which I'm loosely uh, quoting. I got it right in the book, but, in, but, but basically that, you know, the, the, the women, people of color, uh, uh, LGBTQ people in the military, um, are struggling um, with their own organization and with people in their own organization, um, uh, 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 sort of systemic marginalization, but also, you know, overt acts of violence against their bodies. Often. Yeah, I don't know if there have been any studies, but it wouldn't shock me if female, in particular, members of the U.S. military have been injured and traumatized more frequently by male members of the U.S. military than by members of foreign Militaries. I, I know that there was a very recent study from the Costs of War project that said some 3,000 U.S. military members have died in combat in recent decades, and some 30,000 have committed suicide, uh, which is also yeah. understandable after reading the, the sort of stories that are in your book. Right. It would be interesting to see those comparisons. I haven't seen those exact numbers lined up, but there have been quite there has been quite a bit of research on. Uh, level, levels of sexual harassment, levels of sexual assault in, in the military in recent years. Uh, sociologist Stephanie Bonas, who's done some really great research on sexual harassment and, and you know, stalking behaviors also and things like that that, that, that cause injury. Um, and, and again, you know, there are some, some of the people who are coming forward or have come, come forward in recent years of having been sexually assaulted are, are men. And, um, so it, I think it's a problem across the board in the military, but certainly as in non-military life, uh, women are far more likely to be sexually assaulted and sexually harassed than, than are men. The, the, the stories that you begin the book with are really striking, I think are worth, uh, those alone are worth getting the book, Unconventional Combat. Uh, and there seems to be something of a, of a pattern. These are people who are approached by the military very young, uh, too young if the United States were party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child as every other country on earth and and something of an economic draft. These are not wealthy, privileged people with a choice of college or other options, right? That's right. And, you know, in the in the early years of the sort of ramping up of the Iraq war, um, as you know, I'm sure uh, the United States was starting to have trouble uh, getting enough people to enlist, and so they were re-upping people um, for multiple deployments. 
And so one of their strategies was to, to really step up their activity in American high school. And they disproportionately hit high schools in working class and poor areas and, and uh, you know, uh, disproportionately uh, young students of color. And so uh, uh, Wendy Barranco, for instance, one of the, the veterans I, I look at in the, in the book was um, uh, recruited while she was still in high school in Los Angeles. And Wendy had moved to the United States with her mother from Mexico as a youngster and was very patriotic and, and partly entered the military, um, enlisted before even leaving high school, entered the military in part because she felt like she wanted to give back to this country that she felt had given so much to her country. And it was quite a rude awakening. You know, a, a six months or a, a year later, she's in Iraq and working in a in a um, emergency room out in the field uh, as a medic and, and dealing with death and dying and blood and, you know, the kind of things that a lot of 18, 19 year olds uh, who are more economically privileged um, never have to deal with much less at that age. Yeah, another pattern one spots is belief in the propaganda and then disillusionment. And I, I used to think that probably played a huge role in the development of moral injury. But I, my impression is that you sort of get moral injury from taking part in war, no matter what the justifications were or how credible or respectable they were. What, what do you think? I, I think that's right. And it's, it's been an, an open question for me that I'm really curious in as to how much or how much um, one experiences or becomes aware of, of being harmed by moral injury, uh, the extent to which you come to think that what you did was, was, uh, was wrong or, or was justified or correct, like the whole idea of the just war that I think a lot of veterans still feel like Oh, it was an awful experience. I'd never wished it on anybody else, but I was doing the right thing because my country needed me and we were fighting for freedom. Um, does somebody who, who still believes that experience moral injury in the same way that someone who, like most of the people that I interviewed for both of my books, um, came to believe either during the war that they were fighting in or, or after a war, after being veterans, uh, that, that the, the wars that they were um, fighting or supporting, if they weren't in direct combat, were morally unjustified. And my guess is, although I, I haven't studied this and I haven't seen so, uh, you know, social psychologists and clinical psychologists, I think are really kind of getting more into better understanding moral injury. Um, but I, I, would, I would be very curious to, to know, my guess is that, uh, that moral injury is going to be more acutely felt if one comes to believe during or after that uh, one was duped by your your country into uh, into going into imperialist wars or wars of aggression that were not really justified and that were based on lies. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't help thinking that's the case, uh, but then I, I had Matthew Ho, a, a veteran for peace member on this program and a veteran uh, who pointed me to evidence that U.S. World War II veterans who are still with us are to this day committing suicide at a much higher rate than the males of the same age group in the same country and so forth. And there's, I don't think there's a war in the history of the world that's been more glorified and justified. Yeah, that's right. And you, you might remember the World War II veteran that I, um, that I profiled in guys like me, Ernie Sanchez, um, was somebody who was deeply scarred by all of the um, Germans that he killed. He believed that he probably had killed between 80 and 100 Germans during the war, and he thought of them as sons and brothers and people who were loved by members of their family, and he never got over that. And he never became a highly politicized, you know, anti-war, anti-militarism person, but he was, he was more of a kind of gut-level pacifist that he felt like war is never justified and it's and, and the, the the impact it had on him i mean he's he's passed away now but even in his final um year or two where he was his family was exploring getting him into a convalescent hospital he was going in and talking to the people in, who were in the convalescent hospital about the evils of war and the pain of having killed people right there to the very end of his life we're speaking with Michael Messner. His latest book is called Unconventional Combat. Um, what strikes me about the stories in this new book is that here you have young people, primarily women, uh, dealing with not just the horrors of war, but brutal and horrible racism and 
bigotry and homophobia uh, on top of, uh, it, it, I mean, you can picture some of these people handling one or two of these <laughs> injustices and, and trials, uh, but, the, but the accumulation of them uh, it, it seems too much for anybody. Well, I, I think that's true, especially when you read these as individual stories. But I think part of the upside of the story that I tell in this book is that, that uh, when these people come together in organizations, that this kind of collective experience and knowledge they have of gendered racism, homophobia, sexual violence, uh, military sexual trauma, that that becomes part of the collective knowledge that they bring into the veterans peace movement. And I think it, it becomes a resource for them for helping these organizations rethink not just their own internal dynamics, but also the way they connect to other social justice organizations. And it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing for me to watch as a sociologist, how you know, there, there's a sociologist, James Jasper, who talks about the extension dilemma is the term that he uses to describe any social movement organizations um, struggles to, to try to balance their focus on their own issue that brought them together, in this case, uh, peace and anti-militarism for these organizations, but also how do you connect and how much do you connect to other social justice organizations? How do you connect to, for instance, um, uh, uh, migrant justice issues at the border? How do you connect with climate action groups and organizations that are pushing for a Green New Deal or a Red New Deal. Um, and, uh, and, and these veterans organizations are grappling with this. And, and because everybody who's in, in progressive social movements knows that everything's connected to everything else. I mean, we know that, that there's a militarization of the border that's part of the climate justice. I, I mean, it's part of the border justice and migrant justice issue. We know that, and this, you've talked about this on your show, and, and Code Pink has focused on this quite a bit, we know that the um, that that militarization, war, and war spending um, it contributes a huge amount to uh, climate uh, destruction, and that the amount of money we spend on wars and future wars is pulling away from things that we could do to more rapidly transform our economy into a, a just green economy. And so everybody knows these connections are there. Um, and I think older veterans and Veterans for Peace um, have, have always been engaging in uh, coalition politics for racial justice, for um, anti-colonial work in other countries and so forth. But the younger generation, this more diverse generation, brings this experience of, kind of multiple intersecting experiences of oppression and violence that they've experienced and they bring this into this movement, and I think it creates a different way of thinking about coalition politics. And if I could put it really simply, it's, it's an oversimplification, but the older generation of mostly white male veterans, um, they have one foot in Veterans for Peace and another foot, they might be stepping from one organization to another, climate action, racial justice, and so forth. But their weight primarily is always on the mission of that one foot that's planted in anti-militarism work. The younger generation, the more diverse generation, kind of shifts their weight a little bit on that extension dilemma. They have their one foot in about face or um, veterans for peace, but they're more they're they're leaning their weight more heavily into, for instance, um, uh, justice work at the border, like uh, Brittany DeBarros and Wendy DeBarranco that I focus on in their their action at the U.S. Mexico border, um, and uh, um, the, the, they. They are, are bringing an anti-militarist um, knowledge and point of view and strategy to these organizations, to these, these efforts. Um, but I think they sometimes feel a little um, uh, impatient with the, uh, what they see as a kind of slow movement of veterans peace organizations. And I think there's a, there's a much more kind of nimbleness to the younger generation not just because they're younger, but because they bring this different kind of knowledge. And of course, that has its own challenges. If you're a member of an organization that's extending and stretching yourself in all these different directions, you, you risk losing your identity and your organizational sort of um, uh, uh, sense of who you are. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting to watch. And one of the things that I'm 
that I'm hoping for, um, and, and I think is happening in, in a little bit right now, is some dialogue between the Veterans for Peace people and the About Face people um, about the future of the Veterans um, uh, Peace and Justice organizing. And, uh, and I'm really hoping that my book is going to play some small part in facilitating some of this intergenerational uh, dialogue. Um, and I know that the Veterans for Peace has a book club and they're gonna be discussing my book and uh, at the convention this coming summer, Veterans for Peace is going to actually be uh, having a plenary uh, that's going to be focused around some of the issues in my book. And some of the veterans from the book are going to be speaking in that plenary. So I I'm very hopeful that these kind of that this kind of dialogue is going to continue. I think these organizations are so important. I mean, veterans have a platform. Um, I go out on the street corner. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico most of the time. I go out on the corner every Friday for this veterans peace vigil and they're they're working out there uh, currently with um uh anti-nuclear weapons organization that's protesting los alamos uh labs nearby and the veterans just have such a platform when people come by to talk even if they have very different perspectives they have a tendency to want to listen to what veterans have to say and there's a certain kind of base level respect that they that they get from the general public i think for uh, for their points of view, and it's it's so I, I I some of the tensions I point at in this book are tensions that if they don't get worked out could lead to the sort of dissolution of these organizations. Um, but I'm hopeful that these organizations are going to move forward and thrive because they're so important for the future of not just um, how we think about and approach current and future wars, but how these things are connected to so many other important social issues. Well, I couldn't agree more. It's very well said and very well said in the book. And I think that uh, we need about face and we need veterans for peace. Uh, and one of the reasons I think these are some of the best organizations, one of the reasons I've supported veterans for peace for years since since a veteran for peace in New Mexico signed me up and paid my membership dues for me to get me into it was uh, is because they are are focused without a completely limiting focus, but focused on abolishing war because I've seen so many peace and justice centers around the United States over the years start working on every good cause, and they are all good causes, and they are all interrelated, and they all do need that perspective, and we do need those people who are a little more in that one, and the people who are a little more in that one, all working together, uh, but they, they, drop the, they drop the peace part. It's all justice. The peace is gone, you know, and, and we've also seen movements over the years shift from trying to end war and abolish militaries to trying to reform them and perfect them. And, you know, as, as we can get a respectful military free from sexual harassment and, and a green military with solar panels on the on the death machines. You know, this is this will be our. So there are these dangers, right? Just to, just to take the other point of view, right? Yeah. And I, I think the the holding to the mission, as some of the VFC people say, of anti-militarism and promoting peace, it's absolutely crucial that keeping that foot planted in the anti-militarist work and, and in the pro-peace work um, is absolutely crucial. And I think, you know, you can, to take your example, uh, something I've been uh, watching a little more closely in the last year or two, that um, the uh, climate action uh, organizations. I think before the pandemic, especially, the, the, there was a tremendous amount of momentum from young people around climate action. Uh, I mean, really young people, you know, really inspired by high schoolers and, and, and even younger kids, um, climate action Fridays and, and pushing, you know, the UN and, and national governments to try to take action right now to um, address climate action issues. And in very, very little of any of this, uh, was there any discussion of war and military? And it really takes uh, peace organizations like Code Pink, like Veterans for Peace, like About Faith, to bring that critique to that larger movement and to stay there and keep saying it. Um, and it's, it's hard, I think, for a lot of people who um, to hear that because I think there's a wide 
spectrum of people who are interested in climate action and, and, um, and environmental issues. Um, and a lot of them might not have really thought that much about militarism and war yet and, and are still stuck in a really sort of narrow patriotic view of yep. it. And I think veterans for peace and, and South Face, one of the really wonderful things about those folks is that I see them as extremely patriotic. I mean, and, and, and extremely into exercising their, their, um, uh, their responsibilities as members of a democracy. And, uh, and they're reframing what um, patriotism is, I think, in, in really important ways so that people and, can hear. I mean, that, one of my favorite veterans here in, in uh, Santa Fe is a, a, a 82 or 83 year old Marine veteran, uh, um, Mayers, who's, who's uh, uh, Ken Mayers, who's um, wonderful talking on the streets with people, um, with, uh, you know, and, and, and he listens really well and he's He's, he's so articulate, and uh, I, I don't think anybody who's walking along the street and takes a few minutes to talk to, to Ken uh, could, could walk away feeling the same way about things. He's, he's told people, you know, don't thank me for my service. Uh, what I was doing it when I was in the military, I was doing because I was told to. My service is right here, working for peace. That's, this is my service that I've chosen. And all over this country and in Ireland recently, getting arrested for yeah. trying to get the U.S. military out of Ireland. I mean, wonderful work these people do. But uh, just a couple minutes left, Mike Messner, uh, there's, there's also a lot of, I think, good uh, justified criticism of people in these movements uh, for not dealing with the racism and sexism and homophobia within the peace movement. Um, are, are people uh, accepting this criticism uh, in, in a good spirit? How is that going? Well, we'll see. I mean, the experience of, uh, of the uh, half dozen or so veterans that I focus on in unconventional combat has been that they've gotten very frustrated with the lack of openness, lack of dialogue, uh, lack of sort of critical self-reflection by a lot of the older white male veterans. And, and I think it's an open question right now as to whether that's going to be dealt with in a way that will make the um, uh, younger veterans, this more diverse cohort of veterans feel comfortable and, and accepted and listened to. Um, there's still this sort of sense of something I read about in the book of, you know, what does a leader look like? And I think there's still this old it's not just in the veterans movement, it's all over the social movement uh, kind of ecology in this country. Uh, but I think it may be especially true in veterans movements because of the legacy of the military. But it's, but it, it, it's still true that a, you know, a leader looks something like more like what you and I look like, you know, a, a white guy, you know, who, um, and a, a, maybe a tall white guy who was a combat veteran. And um, about 30 seconds. And, Okay, and the, the younger women who are coming in, they are, they are leaders, and, and I think they are absolutely moving and ready to, to create a new form of leadership in, in veterans' peace organizations. I hope so. The book is Unconventional Combat. Michael Messner, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help End War at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.